What's up guys, Tristan here from Plastic on Plastics. Um, for those of you new to the channel, I basically work at an injection molding facility here in Vancouver, Canada. I do basically the marketing and some product design for the products that are produced with Plastic on Plastics. And I saw that Linus Tech Tips came up with a screwdriver. I know they've been working on it for a long time. I've been a fan of Linus Tech Tips for a long time. I think he's from Vancouver as well. I believe perhaps that we grew up in the same small town. I think he went to my high school. I'm not 100% sure, but kind of random. Um, anyways, but before I knew that, um, I've just been watching Linus for a, a long time. And, and basically, I built my first PC because of the information from Linus. And so I was kind of interested to watch his uh, screwdriver video. I don't have the screwdriver. Uh, but I saw this video and I thought it'd be interesting to re-watch again um, for this YouTube channel. Uh, so this is not my initial reaction, but it is a reaction nevertheless. So if you don't like secondary reactions, please leave this video and um, don't watch it. But if you, you know, want to kind of watch this video and kind of think of what my views are on this uh, screwdriver building endeavor, uh, continue. Let's see if it might be interesting. This is it. It's finally here, the LTT screwdriver. And the truth is, we didn't have to make it. There are loads of perfectly good screwdrivers. But this one, this one is the best. A shockingly expensive adventure. I mean, how can it take three years and hundreds of thousands of dollars to make something so seemingly basic? Okay, so the first kind of point that I kind of see here is how, do, how does it cost $300,000 to make a screwdriver? I can tell you like right off the rip, this is, the the thing that turns away all our most of the people that come to us who invent something or want to invent something um we tell them that a, an, an injection molds a hundred thousand dollars so if you don't have an and and it takes a long time to perfect an injection mold not because it's hard to make an injection mold but to perfect the product that you want to make within that mold because once you make it you can't change it um it just takes a long time. So you don't want to invest $100,000 into a mold um, and it not be perfect. So I presume, I can't remember this video, but I'm assuming they had to make more than one mold or something. Cause I, he says like $300,000, I think. Um, and a mold's about 100,000. So maybe he made three molds or maybe that's like salary over the few years, but. To tell you, watching. but first I gotta start paying for this thing with this segue to our sponsor. Oh Okay, well, quickly. Of course it's got a small Apple, Apple 50. Scan the Other than reinventing okay. the wheel, the smart engineer finds the best existing wheel and then refines it. So right out of the gate, Megapro was an obvious partner. First of all, their ratchet mechanism is fantastic and has been proven reliable in the field for over 25 years. Second, they own the patent on what I believe is literally the best bit loader available for a ratcheting screwdriver. Third, and this wasn't a requirement, but it was a huge bonus, their office is a 20 minute drive from ours, making oh, collaboration much easier. There's now, Vancouver, the right? I think special that's it looks more like a Langley kind of as quick there. Um, but the point he made with Mega Pro is kind of interesting. It is very true. A lot of people think that a lot of brands come up with their own stuff, even like uh, well-known brands. Often well-known brands will take a product that you might see possibly in another country and then just rebrand it and bring it to North America. So the amount of people actually creating their own thing is quite small. And uh, it's kind of interesting because simple things like screwdrivers or just anything like water bottles and stuff sometimes can cost or sometimes can be harder to do than more complicated products. So complicated, complicated products, you can kind of take pieces. Like for example, if you want to build a computer company or a pre-built PC company, uh, you could take, you know, the GPU, the CPU, different um, computer parts, put them together. You would have kind of a new thing. But when it comes to something so simple like a screwdriver, you actually have to design it from scratch. Um, there, you're just, the only thing you're kind of taking from existence is the, is plastic, is molten plastic or whatever, or raw materials like copper or steel. Um, so I can kind of see why, well, I, actually I would say the opposite. I, I'm surprised that he didn't just private label some really high-end Japanese screwdriver and that he had to make his own, but that's also Linus and he probably thought he could get good content out of it. So that makes sense. For a majority of people who come to us who invented something or want to say, oh, I want to make a like the, the best quality bucket available, um, 
you know, like that, it's a possible thing. You could take a normal bucket, you could increase the width of the walls of the bucket and create like a five times stronger bucket. But again, to create that bolt, it's gonna cost you $100,000. So if you, you know, if you don't have the, the audience to sell that off the bat, that's a huge risk. Um, and so I'm surprised that he didn't just do the Mega Pro, but it kind of makes sense because he's a YouTuber and YouTubers don't do things that make sense. The really smart thing to do, what Mega Pro implored us to do, would have been to simply rebrand one of their yeah, existing drivers. A little bit of LTT logo there, yeah. some LTT color here, maybe some computer specific bits, and we would have been good to go. Unfortunately, I'm a perfectionist control freak who hates making money. So instead, we embarked on our three year journey that would have us redesign nearly every single aspect of Mega Pro's existing product. Does this look anything alike to you? I mean, they're both screwdrivers. Other than that, the answer is no. I would actually say the answer, they do kind of look similar. I, I must say, <laughs> sorry, Lana, is that the screwdrivers do look similar. Sure, they're, they don't perform the same, but they look the same. At this point, I was recruited. Design handled feels both when you have your hand up at the top or when you have it choked up kind of like this. I settled on a three lobe design for the way it just kind of naturally follows the shape of your hand. And from there, I got to do my favorite thing, rapid prototyping. My philosophy is that there's no point in trying to make something perfect the first time because you're just gonna get it wrong anyway. So for my first attempt, I basically just made up dimensions in SolidWorks and threw it at the printer. This is truly terrible, but that was kind of the point. One of the main reasons it's terrible is it's literally impossible to mass manufacture. We already knew at this stage that the final parts were going to be injection molded, basically shooting a bunch of hot plastic. Okay, before he probably talks about injection molding, it's kind of interesting his mentality with development. There are definitely two versions of development that I've noticed throughout the years. There is the just build it and see what's wrong method. And then there's the kind of like discuss it and really fine tune it, get more renders, more renders, more renders, then build a prototype and then kind of, um, and then kind of like perfect a, a mold. In my personal opinion, I I think the people who just create something and then and then see how it works, I always feel like that is the more efficient way to do it. Um, so many times when lots of people are discussing ideas, uh, they're kind of just throwing out ideas that aren't they don't actually have any research behind them. Um, they might you know find a feature of an idea, uh, a feature of a product, and be like, oh, people might like to do. XYZ with their screwdriver um, and without actually going to the source. And I find that creating a product and actually maybe using it around the house for a couple weeks actually gives you kind of a little bit more knowledge uh, to what you want to fine tune with that product. And I kind of like the way that they did that. Um, just kind of like 3D print it and see what, it, see how it goes. Cause you can like kind of like talk around a circle of how a handle should look, but until you actually hold one in your hand and like turn it, there's no real way to really know until you're actually feeling that product. Plastic into a metal cavity. So there are a couple of important considerations. First, no areas can be too thin. At below about 80 thousandths of an inch, our molten plastic won't flow through the mold. And even if it did, our finished part might be easy to break. No areas can be too thick since the plastic can sag while cooling and look pretty strange. More importantly though, the two halves of the mold have to be able to come apart. So in this first version of the handle, these scalloped areas here would have resulted in the mold completely destroying our part seconds after it had been made. Uh, not, not ideal. Anyway, five versions later, I landed on the first handle that I liked, AKA the long boy. Unfortunately, this so was- kind of an interesting point here. Um, with manufacturing. We find that a lot of people want to invent a thing and they invent it 100% for the consumer. Where in reality, a lot of you guys probably don't understand or know this is that when you're going to the store and you pick something up and it doesn't seem like quite right, it's, it's actually not designed for you. It's designed for the manufacturer. It's designed for distribution. There's a lot of products out there that could be substantially improved for the consumer, but just don't really make sense. And kind of what he's talking about with the handle of with the injection molding there is because the cavities are so, I wouldn't say finicky, they're actually quite, you can actually work with quite a bit of stuff in, a, in an injection molding cavity. Um, there's quite a lot of precision, precision to be had. Um, but there are things that just don't work um, or else the whole process, you would have to reinvent the whole injection molding process or go into a different plastic solution like uh, like blow molding, for example. 
sometimes you might think you have a great idea uh, and you really don't because as much as you think that, oh yeah, I could 3D print this, creating ideas on mass um, in manufacture, in a manufacturing sense uh, with the technology currently available to us humans um, is really, really complicated. I think we got a comment a little while ago asking if you can make like organic designs in 3D or in, uh, in injection molds. Um, organic designs kind of like those AI designs that you see like with drones or whatever, like new, new designs. And the answer is no, because there's no way to injection mold them. So although like AI can produce a way more aerodynamic shape for a lot of applications, a way stronger shape um, that's lighter weight, there's no way to produce it. So it's kind of like, it's cool and all, but you can't really build a company off something that you can't produce. So kind of go again there, kind of makes sense how they could produce the product they wanted or, or the first iteration of the product they wanted. It was one of our first major roadblocks. Linus said it was too big and I had already made this handle as small as I possibly could. How small are Linus's hands? He keeps on making jokes that he had the tiniest hands. Like, okay. Without not not saying anything weird, but I just I just don't I feel like most people can hold a screwdriver regardless of the diameter of the screwdriver. But okay, changing the Mega Pro internals to make it smaller, we'd have to get pretty creative and spend a bunch of money. One option was to decrease the length of the zinc housing that connects the shaft to the handle, but we we're afraid that would decrease how much torque you can transmit through the handle. Another option was to decrease the number of bits to six, but we felt twelve was a necessity for tech work. What we were willing to give up though was the length of the bits by reducing them from 25 millimeters to 20, and making a couple alterations to the zinc housing, we were able to make our handle nearly an inch shorter than Mega Pros and create a handle that is awesome to use no matter your hand size. Two versions later, we arrived at version seven, which is a handle design you can buy now. It's kind of interesting how they, they went that route there. They, they shortened the bits to make the handle a bit smaller. I wonder what they could have done. I guess, yeah, he wanted the, the long boy, if you will. I wonder how that would have been for most people, and then you could give could have given people the longer bits. Um, I'm not. I don't think there's anything wrong. I'm just trying to think if there's anything wrong with the smaller bit. The only thing that I can think with a smaller bit is it'd be really hard to put an electric drill if you needed, you know, if you're screw driving and then you want to switch to a drill and you just want to put it in, because um, it's just like drills. They have to hold something, right? You probably still could. It'd just probably be a little more painful to try to use with a drill. Um, but that means that you're only using the drill or you're only using the bits with the screwdriver, which makes it a lot less likely to start using those bits for other applications. And then you won't lose the bits, which is, which is my problem. All of this work led to the 3D printed prototype in my hand. Looks strikingly similar to the finished product, doesn't it? So given that this was high fives all around done in August of 2020 with a launch scheduled for five months later, how on earth did it take another two years? Internally, we call this Kickstarter syndrome. Up until that point, every obstacle had been overcome relatively quickly and we even had our manufacturing partner locked in. We felt basically invincible. Okay, I'm gonna stop right there. This right here is probably the most interesting point thus far in the video. He calls it Kickstarter syndrome. Um, it's basically kind of like that 80-20 principle. It takes, that can be used for all sorts of things. Um, it takes 20% of the effort to get 80% of the way there, and then 80% of the effort to get the last 20% of the way there. That's how things are with manufacturing. The reason why is just because you're turning something from nothing into existence. And when you see that there's just nothing on the table and then six months later, there's something on the table that you've 3D printed that you've, um, that, you know, there's people ready to manufacture it. It seems like you're all the way there. What people forget though, is that making the product is actually a lot easier than making the manufacturing for the product. So even if you have the product 3D printed and you're like, okay, I can injection mold this. You haven't, okay, you've made the product, right? You've designed the product, but you haven't designed the packaging for the product. You haven't designed how the product is going to fit into the packaging once it's manufactured. Mainly, you haven't designed the mold. You might have the product, but what type of cavities are gonna be in the mold? How many runners? How are you gonna maximize the route, the way the plastic flows like throughout the mold 
to minimize the amount of plastic that you have to regrind and then maximize just the efficiency of the mold. Um, have you designed the cooling for that mold, right? So creating the mold is, is, is a huge thing. He says in 2020, so that's COVID, so everything locked down. A majority of molds are made overseas. There's probably a lot of molds made in Canada. There definitely is, and in the States, but a lot of those are raw materials, the aluminum, whatever. That's all gonna be coming from overseas, or it can be coming from overseas. Um, so when everything locked down in 2020, I mean, that's gonna slow down everything. I assume that's gonna be one of the reasons why. But again, like I said, to, have, to make a product it's, it's just one hurdle, but to make the manufacturing system work for that product, that, that's the main thing. Once you have that, then you can pretty much make anything, right? So that's the challenge that people don't understand. Uh, they have a lot of experience with screwdrivers, for example, or they have a lot of experience with water bottles or hiking equipment, but they have zero experience when it comes to manufacturing. Um, and that's the hurdle that they have to overcome, which is why, you know, plastic on plastic exists, that why there's, he's working with injection molding specialists, I assume. Um, I know he mentioned a, a mold maker or a tooler in, uh, in this video. So he's working with those people and, and to do it that yourself is, is pretty much impossible, but even doing it with someone else is gonna take a long time. And we were tempted to launch a pre-order campaign. But if we had done that, we would have a heck of a lot of angry customers right now because we either would have shipped a bad product or they would have waited two years after submitting payment. As it turns out, going from pretty much ready to mass production ready is a lot of work. To be clear, some of it was still pretty straightforward. We worked with innovative tool and die in Delta to create our plastic molds. And the process for that was, well, I wouldn't say painless because we did have to I recognize, so I, I do a lot of film work, not just for Plastic on Plastics, for, but for other companies as well. Um, I recognize that plaza. I'm surprised I don't know innovative tool, tool and die considering as a marketer in, in sectors like this. I probably filmed like 50% of the uh, businesses in Tilbury. And, and, that, and I think that's where that place is. But uh, I'm surprised I don't know them to hand them over 200,000 US dollars, but that was basically it. We gave them the money, they gave us the molds. $200,000, okay, that makes sense. I'm, I, for that, he probably got, I would say two or three molds for that, maybe $200,000. It's a pretty small product, pretty simple. Um, I don't know, maybe he mentions it, but 200,000 is pretty standard for like one or two molds. And I gotta say, until now, I didn't know much about plastic mold making other than that it's super expensive. But after seeing how it's done, the price tag makes a bit more sense to me. We went with hardened steel molds instead of aluminum ones because they last way longer and our intention is that we are going to make hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of screwdrivers before those molds finally kick the can. This process has to be incredibly precise because ultimately it will determine not only the shape, but even the texture of the surface of the finished product. We chose a satin finish for our handle that looks great out of the box and wears out very evenly, which is technically called CH30 NRRAUM320 if you're a mold turbo nerd. Okay, so this is kind of an interesting point of the video. So in terms of building mold, I'm actually, I don't know much. Uh, I'm not gonna act like I do. That's the engineer's problem. That's the engineer's job. It's really complicated though. I've, I've sat in meetings with these guys and I don't understand a lick of what they're talking about when they're talking about building the mold. So uh, that's that. But what is kind of interesting is the texture. A lot of people don't understand how texture works in manufacturing. And it's really interesting the first time I understood how it is in, in plastic molding. So just like when you go to Home Depot and you see all those like different colors um, for the painting aisle, uh, in manufacturing there is a, a there's systems like that in place. Um, I can't remember what they're called. The, the little number that he said just now is probably part of the system, but I've basically worked in design where we have like a big file, file book thing and you open it up and it's a bunch of plastic pages in it, like pages that are made out of plastic and each page has a different texture. So the texture is actually fully integrated into reverse into the mold. And then when the plastic fills that space, you get that texture. And that's something that I never, ever, ever thought about. Um, you, you, you kind of think about design with products and you think about so many things, colors, strength, durability, ergonomics, the way things are. People often forget about texture and it is actually a pretty interesting, um, interesting part of the design puzzle. And picking texture 
can take a long, long, long time. Just like picking the right color for certain uh, um, products where everyone's happy with that. Texture is something that they, I'm sure that Linus probably took a little while trying to think of what, what texture should be. Um, it's kind of interesting. Uh, most people don't think about texture, but it's just like colors. You just pick one and the machine makes it. While the plastic molds were getting made, we also had to finalize the shaft. You might have noticed that our original designs had the knurling go all the way up to the base of the shaft, but we added this little ridge here, and the reason for that was so that we'd have as much material as possible to hold the shaft onto the ratchet. We tried a lot of different materials for shafts. Uh, these ones are aluminum, which were just too soft and felt kind of cheap. Uh, these ones are stainless steel, these ones are high carbon steel, and then we also tried like different knurlings. This one's straight, which was kind of awful for slipping between your fingers. And what we ultimately settled on was 303 stainless steel for a good mix of durability and machinability. I just want to mention here that we made sure to go fairly aggressive with the knurling, and most PC screws can be almost entirely tightened using the shaft. So you I know a lot of people were kind of given Linus or the whole crew probably a little bit of a hard time because they're charging like $100 for a screwdriver, $90 for a screwdriver. It's kind of interesting though that, what, uh, again, what I notice that people don't see is that each component within a larger product is gonna cost some money, of course, right? And so it's up to the manufacturer to decide how much longevity they want their product to have. Like we said in one of our other plastic, I think recycling is a scam video, is that products only last as long as design allows it to. That's kind of the thing with plastic, is that it's obviously not a very good material for the world, for the environment, right? If it's a disposable plastic. But if the disposable plastic can outlast, um, you know, uh, a thousand other a thousand other alternative materials, then it starts to get to the point where it is actually more um, environmentally beneficial. But, but, here's the huge but, it only works if the design is up to par with plastic. And plastic is such a material that lasts forever that design basically has to be utterly perfect for that kind of, to, to almost say that plastic is a, good material for the environment to work with, if that makes sense. And I kind of, and, and I really do respect Linus Tech Tips for going the extra mile and choosing the better materials for each other little component uh, for the screwdriver. It means that the screwdriver is gonna last longer, it's gonna be better for the environment, it's gonna be better for you. Um, and yeah, so each, if, and so if each component is twice the price, of course, is of course his screwdriver is gonna cost twice the price. While we're on the topic of materials, let's give you a rundown on what the entire screwdriver is made out of. The main plastics, so the handle, the end cap, and the selector ring are all made out of a material called Triax 1120. It's a nylon rich ABS blend that we don't know the exact composition of, it's a trade secret, but what we do know is that it's as strong as frickin' heck and offers a great balance of chemical and abrasion resistance. Okay, so he said, and that is what probably most people have come here for, the plastic, Enthusiasts. In secret. But what we do know is that it's he as said it's in the last triax. couple of years. While we're on the topic of materials, let's give you a rundown on what the entire screwdriver is made out of. The main plastics, so the handle, the end cap, and the selector ring, are all made out of a material called Triax 1120. It's a nylon rich ABS blend that we. Okay, Triax 1120. Uh, ABS. I don't know who makes this. Here we go. Yeah, I mean, like every every polymer is totally different. So ABS is like a type of plastic. I think it's in the, oh, I think, is ABS the number seven plastic? Acrylic natural butadiene styrene. What number are you? It's probably a seven. Yeah, it's seven. Okay, so ABS is not in any particular any particular category, or the category is seven. Number seven is of all other plastics, so you get like number one is PET or polyethylene terephthalate. Um, ABS is a really strong plastic. ABS is actually one of those plastics that you can use for a whole bunch of different applications because it varies based on the additives that are in ABS. So you have AD ABS that is really good for machining, so it's often used in prototyping. Um, and like welding, you can weld it together quite easily. 
Um, and then ABS is also in very, very strong um, or strong required products. Um, and that's basically when you talk about commercial grade or industrial grade ABS. Um, so I think it, Triax, I'm not sure if it's an industrial grade. Okay, so it's a, it's a consumer grade. Basically, it says industries, electronics, household construction. Okay, so it's probably treading the line between the really top, 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 top strength ABS plastics and the lower ones. It's, it's, but in terms of all plastics, I can tell you it's going to be really, really strong. A lot of manufacturers of screwdrivers, probably cheap quality screwdrivers, are going to be using PP or number five plastic polypropylene. Uh, polypropylene is not going to be nearly as strong as ABS or especially nearly as strong as a high quality ABS, which it looks like Triax 1120 is. So uh, not only did they use stainless steel in the shaft, but they used a high quality, very strong plastic in the handle. Um, and so if you're watching his video and you don't know if he's kind of lying about the plastic being strong as freaking heck, he isn't. Uh, what from I can see from this is that the ABS he chose is probably an extremely strong plastic. Now, is it the strongest plastic you could choose? Probably not. You could probably go with the um, with a glass-filled nylon polypropylene, for example. That's what you kind of use for, uh, you might want to use that for military application. Um, you could also use uh, polycarbonate um, that's a bulletproof plastic, but I don't really think those are really necessary. I think a glass-filled nylon polypropylene or an impact poly polypropylene could have being a cool look, it, it can have a kind of a smooth and when you add a texture, it can have a nice look and feel. Um, but I believe uh, ABS or the, his Triax 1120 is probably very, like definitely strong enough for whatever you need. Don't know the exact composition of, it's a trade secret, but what we do know is that it's as strong as freaking heck and offers a great balance of chemical and abrasion resistance. The internal plastics are also mostly Triax 1120, but the bit clips and the little ninja star that's in between them, as we like to call it, are made out of Delrin for its excellent wear characteristics. The last thing you want is for these little holders to just start snapping off on you. That would be terrible. Now, if you look really close... Delrin. Delrin, Delrin, Delrin. These are plastics that I do not know. What is Delrin? Oh, okay. So Delrin is a plastic by DuPont. Okay. And so what actually is Delrin? What's the... What is it made out of? Because like a lot of plastics will have basically um, like polycarbonate will be the actual plastic and then the brand name of polycarbonate is um, Lexan, right? Like same with acrylic and acrylic is, what's, what's acrylic? It's, I can't think of the name right now, but it's like the name that everyone knows. Um, so Delrin is the DuPont version of trying to figure out what it is. I can't see what it is. It says high stiffness, low friction. Okay, so it's high stiffness. That's odd to me that he would choose, that would he would choose a plastic that's known for high stiffness. It has low friction wear fatigue. Okay, he definitely chose it because it says advantages it has fatigue resistance. That's what you gotta want with with a bit with a bit connector that you're you know you're changing the shape so it's gonna be like going like this every time you put something in it. So you want something to wear the fatigue, but it's high stiffness. Generally, you want something with a little lower stiffness in this, or else you kind of or else it's gonna be a little more brittle. It could break if you drop it. Um, I'm not sure if anyone has noticed this to be breakable or the inner clip to be breakable. Um, yeah, I'm seeing here that it says. Wear resistance, okay, he's definitely bought this because it's the high wear resistance. High strength, very good. Stiffness. Hmm, interesting, interesting. I'm not sure, I'm sure I'm sure there's a specific reason why I went with Delrin. I would have been more interested to see if he went with more of like a rubberized type of feeling plastic. I don't know what that would be. I'm sure there's, there's plenty. Um, but the fact that he went with 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 a stiff plastic it seems weird for something that it needs a malleable shape but okay if it works it works we had all of this figured out and all of the plastic molds done by the summer of 2021 hoping for a december launch that's when things got really stupid the zinc ratchet molds were going to be made in taiwan by the same factory that megapro has been using for 20 years 
And then suddenly, they started becoming less responsive. By this point, we had individually approved every component of the ratchet mechanism from the factory, and all we needed was a final assembled sample before hitting go on production. Then, this mess arrived. It's okay, Linus, I got it from here. This is hot garbage. Imagine waiting for your final pre-production samples and then receiving a bucket of disappointment. To summarize, uh, the shaft flops around like a wet noodle. Uh, the ratchet sounds like three gears short of a bad gearbox. And the knurling is basically smooth. It's like we told them what to do and they just didn't do it. And then sent us this and, and it was okay. okay. Everything about this sample was terrible. Okay, well, that sucks. That that sucks. I wonder. I guess he's had. He was wanted to have manufacturing abroad in Taiwan. Generally, you think Taiwan would be pretty good when it comes to manufacturing, um, but that does raise a very interesting topic of onshoring. So onshoring is basically taking products that used to be made overseas and bringing them back to North America or wherever they're going to be used, Germany or wherever they're going to be made and sold, Germany, Canada, U.S. Um, so a lot of people are actually onshoring back to North America right now because freight is so damn expensive, um, gas is so expensive. Um, so if bringing things from China or Taiwan, the, the margins are starting to shrink. And now manufacturing over here in North America, yeah, you're going to be paying your employees a living wage, which is always great versus paying them peanuts over there. But you're saving so much money when it comes to freight and you're saving money when it comes to quality control. Um, imagine, and this has happened uh, to us, that you are manufacturing something overseas, perhaps not even the final product, just something like a piece for your final product overseas. It comes in and it's all unusable. What do you do you know, in that situation? It is and it can be a huge step back. Um, what if you had to push back your launch? How does that work to consumers? These are costs that people are now starting to talk about. And with the internet, word of mouth being such a big thing, um, not only is making things in America or making things in Canada something you can kind of advertise, but also having a guaranteed flow of inventory because you can quality control that in North America is something that you might not tell your uh, customers, but they're gonna notice that, oh, when you buy something, it's gonna arrive on time. It's not something coming from China or whatever. Um, and the ore quantities could be messed up. Um, also kind of interesting in North America, of course, uh, if you're manufacturing over here, generally you're gonna have lower MOQs or minimum order quantities uh, if you're manufacturing in-house here versus overseas. Overseas, uh, because the factories in China, Taiwan are so big, they're only gonna accept MOQs that are really large. And with Linus, um, he has a huge subscriber base, like massive, but he's, you know, having his, his first product launch, he probably doesn't know uh, what that quantity of uh, screwdriver is going to be sold. And having that risk and ordering a large quantity overseas might be something that could be a little scary, whereas manufacturing in North America is a lot less, uh, lot less risky. You can even just tell by the knurling on the shaft. Like this, how could these both even be from the same factory? Well, we can't get too much into that because there are some legal things that we're still figuring out. But basically, the factory that we were using was bought out by a large tool maker and they were now prioritizing, naturally, their own tools. There you so go. There's something that you cannot, you cannot, as much as uh, you might have good connections overseas, you're not gonna be able to have control of everything. Here, you're manufacturing in, uh, in an industrial park in North America, in Canada, in, in, in BC, Vancouver. We have Tilbury and uh, Anasis Island are two major places in the lower mainland where things are manufactured. Um, and you can just, and if you're, if you're the owner of your company, you're invented something, you can walk in whenever you want and check out you know, the quantity, the quality of your product. Can't do that so easy overseas. And, and that's why we see we see a lot of people coming back, right? Especially right now after COVID, oh, so many companies are coming back. Uh, manufacturing is huge. So, so I think it's gonna be probably one of the bigger shifts in terms of uh, employment here, here, in, here in North America is a lot of it's gonna be in that manufacturing sector. Story short, we got fed up with their terrible communication and delays, not to mention their terrible quality, and we changed to a different factory in China, potentially losing our 130,000 US dollar deposit in the process. Once we started getting in samples from the Chinese factory, we had more problems. 
The ratchet, which previously had been the one thing that hadn't gone wrong, started to jam. Okay, so they went to China and still problems. Who would have thought? To show you why, we're gonna have to take a closer look at how our ratchet mechanism works. Press fit into the rear now, of the shaft. Now, before we continue on, I don't wanna say that manufacturing in Asia is bad. We manufacture, a lot of our tooling uh, that we make, like our molds, are, do come from Asia um, and you know, overseas. The efficiency that they have in some of these countries is second to none, considering they're like supplying the whole world. Um, so that's something that you can't really beat out. But if you are, basically take what I'm saying is if you are a smaller person, you don't have the subscriber base of line of sex tips, this is your first product, you're inventing whatever it is, um, you're probably gonna wanna try to manufacture a good amount of them here in North America. And the expensive part of these things, especially when you're injection molding, is building that mold. Like Lana said, $200,000 uh, to build that mold. You can ship the mold wherever. So if you are sick and tired of manufacturing in North America, say you do your first few production runs and you're like, it is way too expensive to manufacture them here. You can ship those molds to China, to India, wherever. You're gonna produce the exact same product now that that mold's uh, created, now that you have a little bit of uh, experience with that mold um, and you can you know, bring them in. Again, like I said, once it goes overseas, it's a lot harder to quality control. So starting, starting here um, is definitely a good option. What you probably will find though is once you start here, you're probably not gonna wanna leave and manufacture um, overseas. Uh, as a smaller producer of anything, uh, it's a lot easier and generally the moving to overseas is a big boy move uh, is what happens when you get bought out by some conglomerate and then they move your factory to, or move your product to overseas and then it goes downhill and then everyone complains that your product went downhill for whatever reason. That's the classic. Uh, so I'm not surprised that China didn't really work out here. Let's see, let's see, let's continue here. Shaft is the ratchet wheel. There are then two pawls that engage with it. So you can see them right here. If both of them are engaged, the shaft is locked. But if you move one of them up a little bit, you can spin the shaft in one direction. To move the pawls out of the way, there are two pieces of Delrin that interact with the selector ring. And it turns out that this guy right here was made five thousandths of an inch out of spec. Five thousandths of an inch! That's like the width of two hairs! But because it's a lever, that error was multiplied across the mechanisms leading to our jamming issues. The bad news is that it took us over six months of barking up various trees to figure out that this was the problem. The good news is that in that time, we tweaked nearly every part of the mechanism to tighten up tolerances, increase reliability, and to dramatically improve the feel of the ratchet over Megapro's already A-tier design. It not only sounds amazing, but we went out and bought all of the screwdrivers that the haters have been telling us are certainly better than their novice first attempt. And by comparison, ours has extremely low back force, making it really easy to get a screw started, and an excellent hand feel. It also has... I must say, buying competitor stuff is my favorite part of product development. When, when we get to just buy, like, or just look into whatever the competitor is doing, just buy it and just break it. I, I love that part of, love that part of the manufacturing or design process. Great time. Happens to be strong enough for heavy automotive work. With and when your product outperforms them, oh, no better feeling. With a minimum spec of 25 newton meters for torque. Although we've actually tested them up to 30 newton meters, and they still work perfectly fine. Should be noted, if you get to that point though, whatever screw that you're reefing on is probably a hollowed out circle. While we were fixing the ratchet mechanism, another thing we played around with was the tolerance of this Delrin ring that holds the shaft in place. We settled on a five thou gap between the sleeve and the shaft, finding that it was the best compromise between a solid shaft feel while still allowing good ratchet movement. There's a prototype here that has a tighter collar. Ah, yes, here we go. Oh, the feel of this is not good, but that's in the past. Today is now, now is today. You know what, whatever, it doesn't matter. Let's go build a final one. And what better place to do it than here at PH Molds in Maple Ridge, British Columbia, where our finished driver handles are currently being produced in the machine right behind us. Let's take a closer look. Yeah. Okay, so they're, so they're injection molding the handles in Vancouver, BC, and I guess bringing in the rest of the, the, the product, the ratchet mechanism from China. Um, that's, that makes sense. Machining the uh, metal portions here in Vancouver would be astronomically more expensive. So that does make sense. Whereas injection molding, because it's such a, a streamlined process, you don't really need much labor or anything for that. Uh, the machine's doing all the work and then the assembler is gonna put it together. 
the change in in uh, in price for labor and stuff like that is going to be relatively negligent uh, depend uh, when you're comparing it to the pros of manufacturing and just distributing in the country that you're actually selling in. Whoa, this bad boy is heavy. Yep. It all starts here in this nondescript paper barrel full of our plastic material called Triax mixed up with these black pieces that are a dye, a pigment, that are going to help us achieve the black color that we want for our screwdriver handle. You're going to vac- okay. That's a lot of pigment. It all starts here in this nondescript paper barrel full of our plastic material called Triax. I, we don't make a lot of stuff out of white. We use a, a lot of PCR. So I, I don't see a mixture in our factories like this very often. I thought there was less ink. It makes me seem like a complete idiot, but I totally thought there was less ink than this. I generally, I thought it was like 1% roughly. Oh, but I guess it's 1% that we use because we're using PCR. Okay, so when you're making a black product, little thing about color, when you're making a black product, um, generally you can often use PCR, post-consumer recycled material, because most because because recycled material can only be like colors and usually dark, dark colors um, because it's recycled for example if I recycle this little water bottle here uh, and then grind it up this plastic is never going to make a white product and so the, everything generally from that you're making out of recycled plastic is going to be um, gray or brown or black um, so you need a lot less pigment, which is why I was like, oh, why is there so much pigment? That makes sense. He's starting with a white virgin material. Um, therefore, he needs a decent amount of pigment. Um, kind of interesting. One interesting thing. I keep on saying interesting, interesting. We, we need like an interesting counter here. Uh, with colors is that the most, when you're talking about virgin material, the most environmentally good material is white because white can a white virgin material, white virgin container, plastic bottle, shampoo, whatever it is, uh, can be ground up and then be ground up and it's the highest value of plastic because it can make any other color after it's recycled. Whereas um, with other colors like black and blue and stuff like that, virgin materials often aren't recycled. You might put it in your blue box recycling, but it doesn't actually get to the recycling facility, which is why a good portion of recycling is a scam. You can watch our video I'll put the link in the comments. Um, and so if this was a white, fully white product, it would have technically been better for the environment, but most people aren't recycling their screwdriver. It's gonna be lasting a long, long time and then probably breaking and then probably just gonna be thrown out. Uh, so it doesn't really matter what the material is. The plastic of this handle is never gonna be recycled or yeah, it'll never be recycled realistically. Mixed up with these black pieces that are a dye, a pigment, that are gonna help us achieve the black color that we want for our screwdriver handle. You're gonna vacuum these up into this industrial dryer apparatus right here, and once they've got all the moisture sucked out of them, they get crapped out into this bucket. So from what I take. remember, I'm leave the bucket there. there's not much to react for the rest of this video. Linus does a really good job um, explaining everything, how the reciprocating screw works, how injection molding works. We have some videos that you can see. I'll add those links to the description as well. Um, but I hope you enjoyed this video. It, I know this video is getting long. I think he just assembles it. Yeah, and there's nothing really to talk about here. At this point, all the hard work has been done. You're basically shooting molten plastic into the mold. It's going to that mold, popping out, and then uh, you're hiring an assembler, a material handler, or I guess in this case, he's gonna to try to do it himself to basically you know, put the caps on or pack it into a box or what have you. Um, so I'm gonna leave it there. I hope Linus likes this video if he sees it. I highly doubt, there's no way he's gonna see this video. Um, but from what I've seen in this video, I just wanna buy the screwdriver a little bit more. Um, the ABS plastic he used for the handle, very strong plastic, very good choice, a little more expensive than polypropylene. He spent a little more, got a better plastic. He spent a little more to get a better, or probably quite a bit more to get a better stainless steel uh, shaft in there. The knurling looks good. Um, the amount of R&D that went into here is crazy. And so it looks like a really good screwdriver. The materials he used is high quality materials. Um, I know if you're just watching this video on your own, you don't actually know if these are high quality materials. 
Uh, the Delrin is probably a very high quality material. Not sure why they chose a stiff plastic, but he probably researched his screwdriver more than I did considering I just watched his video. Um, and yeah, so clearly the R&D was there. Clearly the materials are there. I can see why the price point of the screwdriver um, is there. I don't know if it's worth it until I would use the screwdriver. Maybe I'll buy it and that'll be the next video. Um, but uh, from what I see, very, very good job with Linus. Very good manufacturing, just 10 out of 10 manufacturing. And I hope he sells a lot of screwdrivers. Um, it would suck that if he made this and it would flop. But in, in my opinion, when you're making a high quality product like that, a product that most people are gonna be using or can use for a long time, it's not like it's ever gonna go out of date. Like an iPhone's gonna go out of date. Screwdriver can be used for years and years and years. So at the end of the day, what's the difference between a high-end $50 screwdriver or a high-end $80 screwdriver? It's, it's all the same at that point. You're spending a ton of money for a screwdriver, so you might as well have a good one. Um, that's it for this video. I hope, uh, I hope you like this video. Subscribe if you like. I know this video is, is really long and totally different than what we normally do. If you liked it, please uh, let us know in the comments. See you later.